when, uh, when I announced that this was the topic, Buddha nature, um, earlier today, uh, people just sort of looked at me blankly. I think people know what this is, basically, but um, they just don't know how we translate it in English. And so right after we finished the services, I put my hand on Most Venerable Vintan's shoulder and I'm like, how do you say Buddha nature in Vietnamese? And he was like, huh? So we tried to explain it to him. And anyway, we finally figured it out at lunch. Uh, Phak Tan. Yeah, I can't pronounce it well. Phak Tan. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So in English, we, we call this Buddha nature. So um, I wanted to start with this parable from uh, chapter 8 from the Lotus Sutra. So once a poor man visited his wealthy friend. He was treated to a wonderful meal and then fell asleep. The wealthy friend had to go out to ply his trade, so he sewed a priceless jewel inside the poor friend's clothing as a gift before departing. The poor man was drunk, however, from the wine he consumed at the meal, and so he didn't notice what his friend had given him. After he awoke, he left and went to another country, where he had a difficult time finding clothing and food. However, he was satisfied as a homeless man. A long time passed, and then one day the wealthy friend saw his poor friend and said, What happened to you? Why have you had such difficulty finding food and clothing? I sewed a priceless jewel inside your clothing when you, came last, uh, when you last came to visit me. It must still be there, but you didn't notice it. You're such a fool. Trade the jewel for all that you need, and you will want for nothing. So this is um, a, a parable about Buddha nature. So the true nature of all sentient beings here is what I say, uh, is no different from that of a perfectly enlightened Buddha. So we call this Buddha nature. So we have this Buddha nature. However, we're blinded to this fact by the veil of ignorance that obscures our perception. So this is why, you know, this is what it means the, the man didn't realize that he had this jewel with him. Now there's a difference here in this metaphor with what is actually the case in reality, and that is the Buddha does not give us Buddha nature. In this parable, the rich man gives the jewel to the poor man, right? The Buddha doesn't literally give us Buddha nature. What the Buddha gives us is knowledge of the Buddha nature that is with us all the time. Okay. So then for countless lifetimes, we've wandered in samsara like the poor man from this parable, unaware of what lies within us. So I'll let you read the rest. You, you get the gist of this. Um, so again, Buddha nature is not something that comes from outside of us. It's, it's the, the true quality of our minds. Okay? So as I say here down below, underneath where it says Buddha nature in bold, Buddha nature is the concept that our true nature or our default setting, as I like to call it, is no different from that of a perfectly enlightened Buddha. The only difference between us and the Buddha is the Buddha is awake. The Buddha sees clearly. We don't. We are still stuck in our bad habits from countless lifetimes. I think maybe last time or the, the week before, I, I talked about, you know, we make all these bad decisions and then it's like pulling a cart on a dirt road and it creates ruts, grooves in the road and the wheels get stuck. We're stuck in the ruts. We're stuck in the grooves in the dirt road because of our ignorance. So where does this idea come from? Where do we find it in Buddhist texts? So obviously there's this parable in the Lotus Sutra. And the Lotus Sutra, by the way, we think it was written in somewhere between 100 BCE and 100 CE. So that means between 1,900 and 2,100 years ago. Or to put it more simply, about the time Jesus was supposedly born, right? It's roughly in there, 100 years before, 100 years after. The earliest parts of the Lotus Sutra, I think, are chapters 1 through 9 and 17. And then other texts were sort of gathered and collected and put in the Lotus Sutra, what we know as the Lotus Sutra today. So it's, it's really, the Lotus Sutra is really a collection of different texts that have been sort of gathered under one title over time. So that tells us how old this is. But it's also found in other places. Um, I say in early Buddhism, it's a little hard to say exactly what early Buddhism is, but this is how we would usually talk about it today. There's a collection of sutras called the Anguttara Nikaya. So in the Pali Canon, 
That is, in the, the collection of sutras used uh, in the Theravada tradition in like Sri Lanka and Thailand and elsewhere, there's this one, one particular collection of sutras called the Anguttara Nikaya, and I think it's translated something like um, the discourses that increase by one or something. So it's like the sutras of one thing, the sutras of two things, the sutras of three things. So it's like lists. So for example, the Four Noble Truths, if it was in there in a sutra, I don't know if it's in the Anguttara Nikaya, but if it was in there, it would be under the sutras of four or discourse of four or something like that. So it's this collection of sutras. And then in the, in the Mahayana tradition, uh, I think we talked before about the Agama Sutras. So Monday through Thursday night, here at this temple, we're chanting from the Agama Sutras. Right? Th that's the collection of sutras we're tra tra chanting from. There's a collection of sutras called the um, Ekottara Agama. And that is roughly equivalent to this Anguttara Nikaya. So just to give you some context. Um, so there's the Pali Canon, the, the canon of texts written in Pali used in the Theravada tradition, and then there's this other collection of sutras in the Mahayana tradition that are really only left in Chinese. That we have bits and pieces in Sanskrit. Um, we call these the Agama Sutras. Right? And there's about a, maybe a 60 or 70 percent overlap between the Pali Sutras and the Mahayana Agama Sutras. Okay. I'm a grad student, so I'm fascinated by these things. I suspect maybe not everyone's as interested as I am in the history of this. But uh, anyway, so in these sutras, to make a long story short, the Buddha describes the mind as luminous, glowing. We, when we hear this word luminous, we think about, we think about light, like light from a candle, okay? So uh, the Buddha describes the mind as luminous, but having become defiled, that is, um, covered with ignorance in a way. Okay? So we can think of this like, like the mind is clear water, and our minds as ignorant sentient beings, we have like dye or dirt in the water. Or a sheet, a white sheet that has mud on it. Right? You can clean it. The important thing is you can clean it. Right? We can do the same thing with our minds. And then later in the Mahayana tradition, um, specifically Mahayana sutras, there's a sutra called the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, and this, was from the, this is from the third century. This is roughly when it was written down. Tathagata Garbha is the term in Sanskrit that we translate as Buddha nature. I think Tathagata in Vietnamese you say Nu Lai. Am I pronouncing it right? Nu Lai? New light, right, that's what Tathagata means, okay, so for those of you who are familiar with New Lai, so Tathagata Garba we translate as Buddha nature. Garba means like seed or embryo, right? but we translate it as Buddha nature. And so this sutra talks about Buddha nature, meaning that we are already enlightened. So there's a little bit of a difference here, but here it talks about us being already enlightened. Now this, this idea actually created a problem uh, later in Mahayana Buddhism, particularly in East Asia, because there were people who were saying, well, we're already enlightened, so we don't need to practice. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. So again, it means that our true nature is that of an enlightened being, but we, have to over we still have to overcome our ignorance. Okay, and then there's also, there's another sutra called the Srimala Devi Sutra which is also called the Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala. And this was written around the same time as the, the last one, the Tathagata Garbha Sutra. I mention this in part because this is interesting. Um, there's a lot of confusion in Buddhist texts about women. Some Buddhist texts say women cannot become enlightened, and other Buddhist texts say, yes, they can. Now, it's interesting, for American converts like me, when we think of the different forms of Buddhism, we always think that Tibetan Buddhism is the most liberal. But in fact, um, the tantras, the, the special texts beyond the sutras that are kept in the Tibetan tradition, are some of the most sexist writing in all of Buddhism. And then we, in Western converts, we think of the Theravada tradition from Thailand and Sri Lanka and Burma as the most conservative, the most sexist, but in fact, the Theravada tradition, in, in practice, it may very well be, but in terms of the texts, 
The Theravada tradition actually preserves a bunch of texts called the uh, Terigata. Teri means elder nuns, right? We're here referring to the elder nuns, elders, but the female elders. And gata means verses, like little poems, okay? So these are stories that show quite clearly um, that women became arahants, like them. These arahats, right? They became arahats or arahants. They taught, and the Buddha recognized them as teachers. So you can find this in English, and it may very well be in Vietnamese too, I don't know. Um, so I would encourage you to search for it. But this, so this is another example. The, the lion's roar of Queen Srimala um, is not in this, this Tedigata. This is a Mahayana Sutra, but it's interesting because it's a woman explaining, at least parts of it are a woman, this Queen Srimala, explaining her understanding, excuse me, her understanding of the Dharma to the Buddha. And the Buddha's like, that's right, you've got it. And he, in this sutra, he predicts that Queen Srimala in the future will become a Buddha herself. Now, I, don't, I haven't read the whole thing from cover to cover. I've only looked at pieces of it. So I don't know if the Buddha says, you will become a Buddha in the future, but first you have to be reborn as a man. I don't know if he says that. I don't know if he says that or not in this particular sutra. Um, but it's interesting. I think it's interesting that this is another Mahayana sutra um, that I think really calls into question the view that women cannot become enlightened. Personally, I don't believe that. So I thought I would point that out. That's part of the reason why I chose this sutra as another example to talk about in relation to Buddha nature. So there is an English translation of this sutra. And so this, is, this quote is Queen Srimala speaking to the Buddha. And she says, Lord, meaning the Buddha, the Tathagatakarbha, or Buddha nature, is neither self nor sentient being, nor soul nor personality. The Tathagatakarbha is not the domain of beings who fall into the belief in a real personality who adhere to wayward or wrong views. Lord, this Tathagatakarbha is the embryo of intrinsically pure Dharma. So again, she's saying that Buddha nature, is, so embryo, or like the seed, uh, of the enlightened mind. So it is the potential for enlightenment within us, the true, the true quality of our minds. And so she's saying all this stuff, Lord, the Tathagatagarbha is neither self nor sentient being nor soul nor personality because there were people who misunderstood this teaching. When Buddhism first went to China, apparently the Chinese, they, they were only getting texts very slowly. Um, the, the rate of transfer of the Dharma from Asia to America is happening very quickly. So we're getting a lot of translations and things relatively quickly. But in China, it took centuries. And so at first, they were really confused. And they said, well, if we have this sort of enlightened being within us, it must be, you know, this sort of, un, like, it must be like a soul. And that's what moves from lifetime to lifetime. So this is a correction of that view. This is a correction of that view. So if we go so far as to think Buddha nature means I have a soul, that my personality will continue after I die. It's me that goes from lifetime to lifetime. We're sort of taking it too far. So I think on a practical level, the best way to think of uh, Buddha nature is to think of it as the potential for enlightenment, the ability of the mind to wake up. So then I ask here, why is this important? I think I already gave you the answer to that question, though. <laughs> but why is this important? Can get I'm sorry? Anybody can get enlightened if we already look for the truth. Yes. And I'm, I'm very glad that you worded it that way. You said anyone can get enlightened. So when we, we do, and we say this in English, we talk about getting enlightened. But get has this feeling like, like, get. Enlightenment does not come from outside. So we don't, we don't really get enlightenment. No one gives it to us. If the Buddha could give us enlightenment out of great, if he could, out of great compassion, he would have given all sentient beings enlightenment from the beginning. There would be no samsara. There would be no suffering but we have to work it out for ourselves. Realize. Right, so we realize what is already within us. It doesn't come from outside. So the practice of the Dharma then 
is washing away our ignorance, washing away our bad habits, and, and as I keep saying, revealing what's already within us. Letting that true quality of the mind show. So that's what Buddha nature is about. So are there any questions about this or anything else? I was asking you about the yeah. Buddha nature and uh, sometimes they say the body, Dharma body. Okay, Dharma body is different. Um, here we're talking about, uh, we say the Trikaya, the three bodies of the Buddha. Well, there is sort of a connection with the Dharmakaya actually. So the, the Dharma body or Dharmakaya, this is the ultimate form of a Buddha. But it is a formless form. It isn't a physical form. Here we're talking about the enlightened mind of a Buddha. Right? And so we can say that Buddha nature is connected with that. I mean, it's essentially the same thing. The difference is that we have Buddha nature, but we're not yet perfectly enlightened. The Buddha is enlightened, so we say he has the Dharma body. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. But it is, it's essentially the same thing. It's just a matter of realization. So then the, the next body um, we talk about is the, in English it's usually translated as the enjoyment body. Um, this is sort of an energy body. It has form, but it's not solid material. Think of it like a hologram. I mean, it's not technological. It's not actually a hologram, but think of it like a hologram, right? So it's, it's made from sort of light energy. And this is what um, someone who has a vision of the Buddha or a bodhisattva, if they're you know, deep in meditation or they're chanting with a great deal of faith, they might have a vision, literally, physically, in front of them, like I'm seeing this piece of paper. They may see you know, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva in front of them. That would be the, um, the en this enjoyment body. It's called the Sambhogakaya. And then there's the Nirmanakaya. This is the physical, earthly body of a Buddha. Like the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, his physical body, we would call that his Nirmanakaya. That's the solid material body, right? So, yes, but thank you for raising that. So there is, there is a connection between Dharmakaya and Buddha nature, yes. Everyone is resting in enlightenment today. That's why there's no questions. <laughs> That's perfectly all right. Yes? If uh, nobody has a question regarding this topic, mm -hmm. Not in the scope of this lesson. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, would you think that Dharma could explain the phenomenon of split personality? Dharma could explain the phenomena of split personality. Let me think about that for a minute. I don't think so. Oh well, what would be? Oh, I see what you're asking. I see what you're asking. Um, well, it's just, it's mental damage. That's what a split personality is. It's really a defense mechanism. Somebody experiences so much trauma, so much pain, that their mind sort of splits. It doesn't mean that their mind literally splits. It's not like they literally become two people in a, in a Buddhist sense, you know? But um, a split personality is, it's a defense mechanism. It's when somebody can't handle their pain and so they sort of put it away. And then they can have another personality that can deal with things better maybe. I remember seeing a documentary about a man who had, I don't know, a dozen different personalities. And uh, some of them knew about the others, but some of them didn't. He had some personalities that would come out and that personality thought it was the real person and the only personality. The actual man, the original man, he was, he was sort of hunched over like this and he was constantly shaking because he was terrified all the time. And then um, his therapist would say, you know, can I talk to Peter or whoever? 
and he would completely change. His accent changed, the way he carried himself changed, the way he spoke, completely different. And so what the therapist was trying to do was help him to get rid of the unhealthy personalities and be left with a healthy personality, but not his original personality because his original personality was too damaged. That's what was happening in this documentary that I saw. So that's what split personality is. But no, I don't think there's like a Dharma explanation for it, but just psychologically, it's a defense mechanism. It's a way of dealing with excessive trauma. But it's really rare. It's really rare. Yeah. Because you say it's two completely different persons in one body. Well, it's not really two different people. It seems that way. It's just one person who is in so much pain that they create a new identity to avoid that pain. That's my understanding of it anyway. But it's not like there are two consciousnesses in a Buddhist sense in one body. That's not possible. An interesting question though. Because I, I think um, in the Dhamma, I think maybe there is two souls in one body. You know, you know, so it's just a physical... Of psychological damage. It's just psychological damage. There's, yeah, there's not two, two, two minds in one body. I, I should point out though that in Buddhism there's no soul. We we tend to avoid that word because in English it carries a lot of meaning about uh, a permanent personality, which of course Buddhism does not accept. Yes. I was wondering, are you talking about these um, people that are like, um, are the reserved nature? I was thinking more, well, when she said that, I was thinking more, well, I mean, there's two types, there's one where you just describe, mm -hmm. and then there's another one where they're normal person, and then supposedly you go and they get this enlightenment, or they pray, they chant or something, and they change into a different person, and then it's supposedly, I don't know how to that is, but I think in the Vietnamese culture, I've, I've well, I heard my family talk about, oh, go see so and so, and they, they, they would say like different things, and they change into different, and they change into a different voice, and they change yeah. into. Oh, you're talking about a medium. Yeah. You're talking. Is that what you were asking about? No, you, you were talking about, okay, so you're, you're talking about a medium. A medium is someone who is like a regular person maybe, but then there's like a spirit that comes into their body, and then they start, and then they can tell the future, or they help you with your problems or something. That's not even, that's not really Buddhist, actually. It's not split personality. No, that's different. Yeah, you were talking about split personality, okay. Yeah, you're talking about mediums. Mediums are different. Now, there are a lot of cultures around the world that have this in Africa, in South America, um, and there are many Buddhist cultures that have this as well, but this idea of mediums itself isn't a Buddhist thing. It comes from before Buddhism. It's a cultural thing, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Regarding meditation. Mm -hmm. um, I just noticed uh, what happened last week when I was meditating. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to, the first session, I tried to focus on breathing, uh, the senses breathing in and out from the nose. And for the second half, I noticed that I was thinking about Dharma. Uh, it's just related to this, the topic that you taught last mm -hmm. time. And so I wonder, um, should we not, should I not think about anything or? Because you said uh, thoughts arise and we just need to bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, so is it okay to think or are you not okay to think? Um, well, we can't get rid of thoughts, right? Because thoughts will always arise. The goal of meditation is not to not think, it's to be, it's to, this kind of meditation is about not becoming wrapped up in the stories that we're telling in our head or whatever. But there are other kinds of meditation where we do, we sit in meditation, but we're contemplating, we would say, contemplating the Dharma. The Buddha taught this, and this is what it means. And so, okay, because of this, this is how I need to change my behavior, you know. So we can do meditation like that. The technique that I've been teaching here, though, is to help us create more focus. And then when you have more focus, then it's, then it's easier to do that. Because if we sit and we're doing this uh, contemplative meditation, where we're, you know, contemplating the Buddhist teachings, uh, 
then we start, you know, oh, okay, so this is how I need to change my behavior. Oh, but in relation to this, I acted badly last week. And then when I was 10 years old, my mother said this to me. You know, then, then we start getting caught when we don't have the focus. Do you see what I mean? Um, so what you did wasn't wrong. It's just a different form of meditation. Uh, but I haven't been teaching it here. So if it happens naturally and you're able to focus and you find that useful, then go ahead and do that. It, it just happened last time. Yeah, yeah. Because when you were talking about the, um, the difference between Buddha and us is his perceptions. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, uh, for us, if we, we see different people or we be able to recognize whether or not that person is Vietnamese or, or Chinese or, or Caucasian because our perception. Mm -hmm. right, so I, for some reason, I just look at the table clock and they say, I just need to know that it's yellow color, but I should, it's, I should, uh, I should not differentiate whether or not it's like the, the length, the shape, and uh, so that's why I was focused at that mm. point, and I couldn't get, for some reason I couldn't get rid of it, and they were like, oh, I should, and then it stopped, so I was a little bit confused. Mm. My, my recommendation for now would be to focus on focus, focus on focus. Um, I'm not sure actually uh, if I'll be here this summer. I may be gone this summer, uh, but in the fall I should be back and we'll do another program like this. And maybe then we can look at doing contemplative meditation. Maybe we can talk about that if, if people are interested. We'll talk about that at the beginning. But now I would focus on focus. Yeah. Because, you know, I think uh, some people, you know, thinking, but they don't know whether thinking is right or wrong in meditation. Sometimes I, I, I know meditation doesn't mean, you know, we have a blind mind. Right. Because we, 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 we ignore the thinking mm -hmm. to be a blind mind. But that's, that's not meditation. So the, the thing is, what is concentration? Mm -hmm. Concentration on what? That's the thing. You're right. Right. It's, that's a very good way to put it. It's not just blank concentration. It's concentration on what? And so when we're sitting in meditation, right now we're trying to calm our minds because crazy thoughts come up and we're thinking about our busy lives and everything. So we're trying to calm our minds down. And then we start to calm our minds down. Then we can look a little bit deeper. And then we can see um, physically in our bodies. I'm clenching my jaw when I'm meditating. Okay. That is a form of suffering. This physical tension is a form of suffering. Let it go. Oh, uh, my shoulders are really relaxed. Okay, that's good. So I'm going to try and spread this relaxation through my whole body. So we're, we're, we're discerning, right? We're using our perception to discern this is healthy, this is good. This is causing me suffering. I need to let it go. I'll cultivate this and let this go. So that's the purpose of our focus. Yeah. Yes, that's a good way to put it. It's concentration, but it's not blank concentration. Yeah. Let me double check the time real quick. I think we have time for one more question, if there are any more. Yes. Is there a way we can tell how we have progressed as far as meditation? Does it mean, do you think, well, am I doing better than I did a year ago or whatever? I mean, is there any type of... Um, I don't know if I would say there's a benchmark, but in general, if you find that you're able to sit more calmly um, for a longer period of time, I know if I sit for too long, my whole body will tense up and my mind will be just like, get up, get up, get up, get up. So if you can sit for longer periods of time before something like that happens, if your mind is quieter and more calm, that's within the meditation experience itself. I would say that is a sign of progress. That's a sign of progress. A real sign of progress is being able to sit calmly in meditation and then to take that calm into your daily life. So meditation and our daily lives, we really don't want them to be completely separate things. We're developing a calmer, more peaceful mind, a mind that is more aware of the Buddha's teaching so that our behavior will change in the world. So if you find that you're less snippy with people who cut you off when you're driving or whatever, these are, these are even better signs of the result of your whole study and practice of the Dharma. Yeah.
Thank you. How is the meditation itself like? What what would you say? Do people sit for an hour or more or things like that? Well, some people can physically sit for an hour and they can look really impressive, especially in these robes. They can look really impressive. But then inside, they're crazy, right? Some people are good at faking it. So just being able to sit for a long period doesn't necessarily mean anything. There are some people who can only physically sit for a short time, but when they sit, they really do it well. They're not chasing after stories in their head. They're feeling maybe they're doing a meditation on compassion and they can really draw up a really powerful compassion. So it's, it's hard to measure it that way, I think. Yeah. So it's a difficult question to answer, basically. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and stop here.